Telling a story with a character isn't the easiest thing in the world, especially in the world of 3D digital art. The pros sometimes do this by using motion capture to record how a character might move. This is done by using an expensive motion capture system to record body movement. But honestly, this tech isn't for everybody yet. I mean, who has the money to set up a rig like this? Welcome to my first five minute lecture where I teach you how it's typically done, then I show you how you can get started doing it yourself. This is a little different from my other classes, which are a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to do something. This class is a great supplement to watch before or after you've already completed the project class. What project class, you might ask? Don't worry, I'll tell you the classes and the lectures that match this class at the end. Let's get started with how things used to be, the old school way. Well, animators used to have to draw each individual frame and then display them in a quick succession to give you the illusion of motion. There were some tricks they could do to make it easier, like reusing the background, but it was definitely more work intensive. Now for 2D animation, computers can help us along by allowing us to copy and paste one frame to another and then make changes to that frame so you don't have to draw every frame from scratch. Animators can also make use of something called tweening, where you specify the beginning and the ending condition and then the computer figures out what to do in the middle. This can save tons of time, but the look of the animation definitely has some differences. Many people prefer the look of drawing each frame, which is called frame by frame animation, over the use of tweening. This brings us to 3D digital art. We typically don't work on a frame by frame basis because your models are too complex and time consuming to recreate each frame. I mean, imagine recreating a character that took you 80 hours to create for every frame when you're animating at 24 frames per second. It makes me tired just thinking about it. In 3D animation, our approach is pretty similar to tweening, but the computer power and the ability to select different start and end positions is extremely powerful. I mean, of course we can have the computer figure out rotations and traveling and scaling, but we can also use bones to get objects to deform in ways that create the movement we're looking for. This is how character animation is typically done. We can even go a step past that and animate the base shape of the object. One way Blender does this is with shape keys, which is the actual movement of the vertices in the object. But that's not the only way. There's also bendy bones and animating with curves that also give their own animation effect. I want to keep this short, so I'm not going to even get into simulations like water and smoke and other physics-based motion. I'll save those for another five minute lecture. So let's run through a quick demonstration of how a simple animation in Blender is done. So this part is not really supposed to be a tutorial. I just want you to understand what goes into doing an animation in Blender. So we're gonna start with this block here. Now I'm gonna move the block to where I want it to start at and make sure the cursor is the right place in time and then I lock the location. Then if I move the block to where I want it to be next, which is frame number 56, and I move the block there and I hit lock location again, you can see that the block is going to move. So this I'm gonna hit play and you can see that the block moves. So this is just translation, but I don't have to just do translation. I can create another block to show you the point again. And I go to the frame that I care about to start with. And this time I lock rotation. Then I go to the 60th frame, which is the next point in time, and lock rotation again. Now Blender will figure out what to do in between so that it creates this motion. Like we said, it's something like tweening, but in 3D, people don't typically call it that. So not to belabor the point, to just to show you a third time, I'm gonna do scaling. So I go to the first frame, I lock the scaling this time, then I go to the 60th frame, and I'm gonna scale it up just a bit, and then I lock scaling again. Now when I hit play, you can see that in all three cases, Blender is translating or scaling or rotating. 
Now, just to show you how much control you have over that, I'm gonna show you Blender's graph editor. So the graph editor is there and the block that's rotating is selected. And this is a depiction of what the rotation looks like as a graph. Now, just to give you an idea of something you can do, you could change the graph so that it's completely linear. And now you can see if I change that angle of that graph, you can see that I can make the block rotate continuously. So if animation with 3D digital art sounds like something you'd be interested in doing, take a look at these classes. They are good starting places depending on how much time you want to spend and what you want to focus on. So I hope to see you in the class and I'm really interested in seeing some of the projects that you create. Are you still here? Excellent. But everything you needed to know was in that first five minutes. But if you absolutely cannot wait to get started and you wanna do something that's on this particular class, I'm including three short lessons that will help you get started with Blender. Now, don't feel like you need to do them here. They're covered in all the other classes, but if you just really wanna get started right here and don't wanna to go to the other classes, here you go. This is the screen you see when you first open up Blender. Now I'm using version of Blender that is 2.80 and it marks a pretty big difference between 2.79 and everything from before. So if you're using 2.79 first, I strongly recommend you go ahead and download and install Blender 2.80. It is after all the future and there's a bunch of things that you can do in 2.80 that's just plain cool that you can't quite do as easily in 2.79. Um, so I highly recommend that you do 2.80. And if you don't, I recommend you look at some of my other classes where I cover in depth how to use Blender 2.79. So let's get started. Now I want you to be able to get up and running as quickly as possible. So I'm not going to cover every single thing you see. You could spend a lot of time trying to learn all the ins and outs of Blender because it's a very deep program. So the first thing that's really important for you to know is the 3D viewport. This is everything that you'll do in three dimensions. Your modeling, your sculpting, your painting, if your texture painting in some cases will be in the 3D viewport. So this is a really important area and that's everything in this region. The second thing that's really important to use or at least understand what it is, is this outliner over here. So the outliner has all of the objects that you've can be found in your 3D viewport. So you can imagine if you had lots and lots of different cubes and objects and models over here, they might be hard to find. So you can look on this right side at the outliner and then see. So everything can be organized in what they and what Blender calls collections. And you can create your own collections by right clicking and selecting new. You can change the name of objects. For instance, I have this cube selected and you can see over here that it's white and that's how I know it's selected and if I want to change its name to big cube for instance I could certainly do that and then I could search over here for big cube if I had lots of things and it would show me where it is so this, if you're going to be doing any modeling you're going to have to add objects so the easiest way to add an object is to hit shift a now I'm going to add a UV sphere here, and that's a sphere. And the reason you cannot see it is it's because it's inside of this cube. So I'm gonna hit G that you already know how to do, then X or Y, and that allows me to move that object. The other way to add an object is to go to add, and then I can pick mesh, for example, and this time I can pick a cylinder, and it's going to spawn right there. Then I hit G and grab or Y, and then move it to the side. Now the reason they keep forming inside of this cube is because that's where my 3D cursor is. So if I put my 3D cursor somewhere else and I say shift A and I pick cube and that's where this cube will now appear. So that's how you add an object. The other way we interact with objects, we mentioned this a little bit before, is that we can select vertices, which is over here, lines, like this and then also faces and so if we hit a face and then we hit G for grab and then C for example we can move that face straight up in the Z or I can go ahead and pick vertex select mode I can select the vertex and then I can grab Z 
and also move it up or down. So that's how you select faces or vertices or lines and move objects in different ways. So now let's say that I wanted to select a loop of an object. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of 3D cursor mode and back into the default mode. Left click on the sphere. I'm going to hit numpad period to center it at our view. I'm going to hit alt A to take all to un or deselect everything. Now let's say I wanted to just select a kind of circular region around here. In order to do that, I hit alt and then I click. Right? Sometimes you have to click more than once to get what you want, but but you can see here that I can select just this circle or loop selection. So if I hit scale for S here, you can see that I'm scaling that entire region around. Now, if I wanted to change the entire thing, I wanted to make the entire thing bigger, I would still select everything and then hit S for scale, and that makes it bigger or smaller, depending on how I want to do that. Now, let's say that I wanted to only scale it in one axis. I would hit S and then X, and now you can see that I'm only scaling it in the X. And I can do that same trick that you learned before for holding it only to two particular axes. So if I hit S for scale and Shift Z, now it's going to hold the Z the same the entire time, and I'm only scaling it in the X and Y. The other thing you may want to do is to extrude different regions. So let's say that I wanted to extrude this little square out because I wanted it to look like, you know what, I can't really even think of anything that would make me think of that. But let's say that I wanted to extrude this region. There are a few ways you can do that, but the easiest one is to go into face select mode, select that face, and you're going to hit E for extrude. And that just allows you to extrude that face directly out. So if I hit E for extrude, I can do that. I can also go into the object. So I can hit E for extrude here, then I could hit E for extrude here, and then I can hit E for extrude and go into the object. I can also scale it. So I can hit E for extrude, and then I hit enter, and then S for scale, I can make that face smaller. And you can see that it's still on the face now. So if I hit period, I can center us on that, and then I can grab, and I can move it around. So that is how you extrude and how you scale. The next thing that's really useful is loop cut. So we talked about loop select, but let's say you wanted to create a loop. So the best way to do that is to do control R. And once you hit control R, you can use middle mouse button to increase how many loops you're actually cutting into the into the object. So I'm using a cylinder here. If I wanted to create three loops, I would just do that. And I'm just once again using that middle mouse button. Now once I left click, I can slide them along the lines. Now let's say that I wanted them to be completely in the center, equally spaced. I would just hit escape. And now I have those loop cuts. So if I go into vertex select mode and I hit alt to do the loop select, I can now select the different loops just like I did before, but they're loops that I created. And I can also do the scale that we talked about before. And that gives me a different look. Now, hopefully you're getting an idea of how you might create different shapes from being able to do extrusions and scales and moving different vertices around. The next thing that's probably one of the most important things for being able to make things look better is this set smooth. So set smooth allows you to make an object that was really faceted and then make it smooth. So it looks kind of strange when I put it on this because this was a really sharp edge object. But I'm going to go ahead and add a UV sphere. It's over here. And then I'm going to 
G for grab, shift Z because I want it to stay on the same plane and we're going to move it where we can see it. Now I'm going to go to object, shade smooth. So now if I look at this sphere, you can see that it's very smooth. And now shade smooth, it's good. And if you're not used to doing 3D modeling, you probably don't know this, but it doesn't cost us any computational power. So you can make it smooth without it ever slowing down how long it's going to take to render or how hard or how long it takes you to interact with this 3D viewport. You can imagine that if you had a world with lots of different vertices that this would eventually slow down and it would be really choppy and hard to interact with. But when you use Shade Smooth, that is not the case. Now, the last thing I want to show you, and I'm just going to scratch the surface of the modifiers. There are lots of different modifiers you can pick here. I'm just going to show you a couple. One of them is subsurface. Now, I'm going to turn off the shades move by going to shades flat so you can see it here. Now, this one on the right side that says view deals only with the view, and the, white, and the one on the right deals with the render and I'm going to talk a little bit more about render later but if you increase this you can see that it makes it seem like we have a lot more faces now you can do this without actually changing the geometry so if you look close at it it seems like we have many 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 tiny little vertices but in actuality we only had to model this this is one way to make things smoother but it's not the most efficient all the time because the computer does have to figure out what to do with all these vertices. So sometimes it's better to simply use Shade Smooth uh, than to use Subsurface. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that off. The next thing that's really, really useful is the Mirror Modifier. Now the Mirror Modifier does exactly what it says it does, but you can't see it here because our object is centered. Now if I go into Edit Mode, and I hit X, grab, G for grab, X, so actually Y, and I move this to the side, and I make sure that it's shadowed or mirrored about the Y axis, you can see here that I now have two objects that are mirrored about its origin. So that's the important thing to know, is that the objects are mirrored about their origin, unless you decide to mirror it about something else. That's a more advanced option, but you can do that. You can mirror an object not with, with respect to something other than its origin, but if you're just doing the object alone, the origin is probably the easiest way to do it. Now the next thing you're going to want to be able to do is move the individual parts of your object. So I'm going to select my object and I'm going to go from what I'm in now, which is object mode, into edit mode. Now in edit mode, I can actually make changes to the object. So I go over here and I select vertex select mode, and now I can select these points. Now I can move them just the same by hitting G and X or Y or Z, just the same, and I can do the same thing for the lines. As far as selecting and moving, they all work the same, and I can go over here to face select mode and do it much the same. So I'm going to tab out of that and that takes me back to object mode and that brings us to being able to rotate the object. So if I hit R, I can now rotate the object. Now rotating it like that wasn't that useful, but if I hit rotate for R for rotate, Z, I can rotate it about the Z. Or if I hit R and X, I can rotate it about the X. And that holds also in edit mode when you're doing either the vertices or the lines or the faces. Now, let's say that I wanted to move this along a relative axis. So if I hit Z, you can see it moves relative to the global axis. But if I wanted to move it relative to how it's been rotated, I hit Z again. Or in this case, I could hit X or hit X again. And that would also, now in this case, I didn't rotate it about the X, so that doesn't really make any changes. So you can rotate it globally by hitting R and then the axis, or you can hit it, you can do it locally by hitting Z, for example, and then Z again, which will do to the local axis.